Joining me now to talk about the controversy surrounding the film and about the film, two writers and two film critics from Fort Lauderdale, John Meacham of Newsweek, his February 16th cover story, Who Really Killed Jesus, offers analysis to that question. From Washington, Christopher Hitchens of Vanity Fair. Joining me here in New York, David Denby of The New Yorker and David Sturrett of The Christian Science Monitor. Here is The New Yorker, is Passion Dangerous, David Denby, uh, Who Really Killed Jesus, What History Teaches Us, The Storm of a Mel Gibson's A Passion, John Meacham and Vanity Fair here, passion play, Mel Gibson's bloody gospel. John Meacham, um, how much of this, would characterize this film for me in terms of the reality of the events of those 12 hours? What Gibson has done is relied on very literal readings of the New Testament text to depict the last 12 hours. The New Testament texts are not historically accurate documents necessarily. So what's happened here is you have a lot of characterizations and a sequence of events that might make dramatic sense, but which don't necessarily make a great deal of historical sense. The chief example is where the Jewish mob is seen chanting and forcing Pilate into doing something that Pilate apparently doesn't want to do, which is quite ahistorical given everything we know about Pontius Pilate's 10-year reign in Judea. Uh, Christopher, tell me about Mel Gibson and where he's coming from in doing this. Well, Mel Gibson has made it easy for us uh, in this speculation. Um, he's a member of a, a wacko, schismatic sect that rejects the authority of, of the Pope and, and in specifically rejects the findings of the Second Vatican Council, one of the most important of which was the um, lifting after centuries of the condemnation of the Jewish people for what was once called deicide, for the, for the murder of Christ. Um, his father is um, never happier than when talking about the uh, absence of any evidence for the Holocaust, shall I put it. And Mel Gibson repeatedly says that his father has never told him a lie. And when asked who his sources for the film are, um, Mr. Gibson doesn't just mention the Gospels. He mentions a 19th century German nun, Anne Catherine Emreich, who's um, evidence against the Jewish people was that they used Christian blood, the blood of Christian babies to be exact, uh, to make matzos at Passover time. The film is incidentally set at Passover time. I, I think most people will be uh, proof against the nastiness and stupidity of this film. I don't think it will be anti-Semitic in effect because I think it, it's, it's boring and it's sadistic and it's lurid in equal measure, but I think it is quite definitely fascistic in intention and fascistic in its aesthetic. And I, I hope that no one watching this spends their own money to go and see the film. Because of what you just said, because it's fascistic and Largely, because... It, it, it is intended as, and I think will fail as, an incitement. And it is intended as a, a, a piece of biblical literalism that actually is a parody even of the most contradictory and self-contradictory bits of the Gospels. St. John doesn't agree with St. Matthew. Yeah, but, absurd events are supposed to occur, according to the Gospels, such as the opening of all the graves in Jerusalem and dead people walking around. Not even Gibson puts that in, but he does put in um, a satanic succubus in the Garden of Gethsemane, for which there's no biblical authority. There, there's a repeated appearance of a sort of demonic, superstitious, um, sorcery-like uh, figure. This is all part of Gibson's fevered yeah. imagination. And he does make it seem throughout as if Pontius Pilate is a humanitarian who is... A, a mere serf in a Jewish empire. And actually, the Emperor Tiberius got rid of Pontius Pilate, among other things, for his brutality towards the Jews, which was considered excessive. So this is, this is a simple-minded, claims to be literal-minded, is in fact a falsification and a fascistic one, and an incitement, I think, also to, to, to sadomasochism in, in the... In the um, in the less attractive sense of that word. Okay, before I come to this table in New York, John, having listened to that, you agree with with that take from Christopher? Or disagree well, in what sense? Well, this is a d the line between theology and history. Gibson has made a theological document, an evangelical document, he hopes, by drawing on all the sources that Christopher mentioned. But what he's, for, for in a way... For what purpose? To simply, to be, uh, what purpose beyond making a movie on a subject that interests him? Well, he said that the Holy Ghost helped, to serve, helped uh, direct this. So he clearly believes he's on a mission. Now, if this is a mission of conversion, I don't think it's going to work because I think that non-believers coming to this will have very little sense 
of why this is happening to Jesus of Nazareth. It, it, there's not a lot of dramatic context about Jesus' uh, mission, about his ministry, and about the a central story of Christianity, which is that the love of a father for a son redeemed the sins of the world. I think people are going to walk out of these theaters thinking that a very angry priestly cast forced uh, the image of Roman justice, Pontius Pilate, who has a beautiful wife who brings the vir Blessed Virgin towels with which to wash up her son's blood, which is, again, ahistorical. The New Testament is not an ancient Middle Eastern associated press report about this happened at this hour and this happened at that hour. And if we read them that way, we fall into very, very dangerous territory. All right. David Denby. I hated this movie. Um, and uh, what you're watching here, after some preliminaries, uh, is a movie about the torture to death of a young, handsome, strapping young man who is, you know, cannot fight back, will not fight back, of course. And uh, I, I just don't see how there's much spiritual meaning here in what is, in effect, a, a two-hour snuff film. Now, did Jesus suffer on the cross? Of course. The last 12 hours of his life were uh, unbelievably horrible. But what we're talking about here is how do you represent that? Christian artists have been wrestling with this issue for a thousand years. And most of them, not all, but most of them have emphasized not the physical destruction of Christ, but the spiritual meaning of the of the central path. If you look if you look at the great line of Renaissance artists, with some exceptions, the body is relatively unmarked. Here's the proof that Gibson is crazy. He told his cinematographer Caleb Deschanel, who does a fantastic job, that he wanted the movie to look like Caravaggio's paintings. Mm. Okay, so one looks up Caravaggio and what do you find? That he did a flagellation scene and in the Caravaggio's flagellation scene, the body is virtually unmarked. Why? Because Caravaggio, as well as all these people, including Goya, who was afraid of nothing, you know, did all these pictures of dismemberment. When he did his genre picture of the crucifixion, the body is relatively unmarked. They knew, they didn't use words like sadism and masochism, but they knew about such emotions. In other words, that there was a dangerous fascination uh, in, in, in seeing this disintegration of a body uh, that was very different from any spiritual meaning that you could take so out they, of it. They did not want to go there because they did not want to 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 escape the spiritual meaning. They didn't want to. Yes, what they what they emphasized was Jesus' sacrifice and then the transfiguration, uh, you know, in, back into Godhead because they knew the dangers of fascination with the purely destructive. What you've got here is one of the most gruesome movies ever put on the screen. I mean, there are horror movies like this that kids go to on Friday night in the spirit of play. You know, and they know it's, it's completely stylized and they don't take it seriously. This is done with a kind of grim, relentless realism. He's flogged and flayed for 10 or 12 minutes at a time in close-up, in slow motion with all the resources, uh, you know, of cinema, including the music that you heard in the clip behind it. And, uh, and I don't, I'll be damned, you're literally, I suppose, mic. if right. there's any spiritual meaning in that. I'll, I'll come to you in a you're second. Are, you're, undermining ahead, my, you're undermining my call for a boycott, I'm afraid, Mr. Genry. I was, because you I was say, hoping, if, if, I was if, hoping that I was able to keep people away, and now you're encouraging all the sickos to flock into the movie. But you're, you're quite right in what you say. I mean, it's very strange to me that Mel Gibson, who's also spent a lot of his time making very vulgar and persecuting remarks about homosexuals, would appear to want to make a movie that's an appeal to the gay Christian sadomasochistic niche market, but, but, I, but I don't pretend to understand the lurid mind of this guy. Do you, think, it, do you really think that's it, where I, he I is? Should say, though, I should say, in case I was misunderstood the first time, I don't think it is for Jews, in other words, to be condemning the movie. It's for Christians to say, this is not what our faith uh, means to us. Uh, well, that it, it, isn't, it, isn't supposed to, it isn't supposed to be an, an incitement of unreason. Or, or well, at least a, let's, let's ahead, hope John. that they would want to say that. John? Well, as a not particularly successful Christian, let me say that, and in the event people don't follow the Hitchens boycott idea, there are two very important points I think should be made. One is that the use of Aramaic and Latin makes the movie unfold at a kind of documentary remove that I think confers a deceptive kind of authority on what's going on. It puts Gibson in the position of interpreter and translator of the most important story in Western history, and I think people should be careful there. And leaving aside the violence for a second, I think it's very, very important to remember that the Jews are not to blame for the death of Jesus. The Roman Empire executed Jesus of Nazareth on a 
charge of sedition. There were two other people already ready for capital punishment, had been tried and were ready to be executed on that day. And we all know what has happened in the past for two millennia when people have blamed mm -hmm. the Jewish people disproportionately for what happened in the year 30 A.D. Uh, Christopher, I think you're right about it. All of this talk is doing nothing but putting people in theater seats. I mean, I, whatever boycott talk you are trying to lead is going to fall on deaf ears because of programs like this and cover stories like Newsweek and because it is the greatest well, story. I, I mean, I, uh, guess, I guess by writing about it myself, I've, I've encouraged this. But exactly just right. Just on the point, on the, Aramaic, well, the Aramaic point Mr. Meacham makes, and his excellent essay in, in, in Newsweek um, refers to as well. Mr. Gibson claims to have removed from his film uh, the the chant by a group of Jewish people saying, let his blood be upon us and on our children forever. We learned this, we learned this morning, in fact, he hasn't removed that scene from the film. It is still there in Aramaic. He's just cut the subtitle. So, that, uh, so if you, here, if you know Aramaic, well, then you will, you'll hear it. Here, well, no, <laughs> but it, 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 no, it, no I mean, I mean no, ex I, I'm sorry. I mean, when it's played in uh, Syria and Egypt, um, and when it's uh, taken around the okay. world where we know that anti-Semitism is not just a, a, a metaphorical or uh, metaphysical threat, um, anyone who wants to can put the subtitle right over the Aramaic and, it, and the scene is still there. Gibson said he'd taken it out. He lied about this. He assured many rabbis he'd removed it. He hasn't. He just trimmed the subtitle. This he is did, a guy he didn't tell the whole word, truth whose word is, word is worth absolutely nothing and who knows perfectly well. Oh. When the Pope went to Damascus, uh, a few m months ago, he was greeted by President Assad, who said to the Pope in front of the Grand Mosque in Damascus, we have a common enemy. Uh, we hate the Jews who killed your, your Christ. Now, the Quran actually says Jesus was not executed on the cross. So Assad was also spitting on his own holy book as it happens. But believers will sometimes do that if they're fanatical enough, as Gibson clearly is. Assad said that to the Pope? So I said exactly that to the Pope. In other words, this is, this is not, this is not uh, small stakes that, that we're playing for. When that film gets shown in that region, as you can bet it will be, as Gibson knows it will be, that statement is still in it, mm -hmm. in Aramaic, and they can put any subtitle on it they want. And yes, that's what Assad said to the Pope, I, even though the yeah. Quran specifically do not, does not blame the yeah. Jewish people. I, I've the, loaded uh, this up, the, and I didn't mean to do it this way, David, in terms well, of three people who have... No, stay with me, Christopher. Please, three people who have strong feelings about this. My impression is you like the movie. Well, I think it's a very well-made movie. Uh, yeah, I mean, Mel Gibson is a good movie director. He's shown that before. Uh, Caleb Deschanel is a sensational cinematographer, as David Denby said before. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Jim Caviezel gives a really strong, kind of relentlessly focused performance. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good movie uh, in, in that sense. I also think, um, and by the way, I share like just about all of the misgivings which have been stated <laughs> here tonight, uh, and I've and I've, I've I've written so. Uh, but I think it's a more more interesting movie in some ways, especially cinematically and, and also historically, than, than has been coming out so far in a lot of the discussion about it, uh, because there are so many different ways to think about it. Um, for example, something that, I mean, something that has been mentioned here tonight briefly is the idea that uh, Mel Gibson uh, seems repeatedly drawn not just to violence, but to suffering in his movies. Uh, he, Br Braveheart is, right. is exhibit A, uh, but there are plenty other examples. And um, one might look at that positively and say, that, well, he's always been interested in uh, the suffering hero, the Christ-like figure in secular surroundings. Uh, now he is simply, um, you know, carrying that over into his religious uh, interests. Uh, but one can also flip it around and say uh, that he just has a morbid fascination with violence and suffering, and that by rapping in, in, in religion, he can push it uh, farther than he ever has before and okay. get away with Someone it. Someone expressed that earlier here tonight. Well, I certainly yeah. agree with the last part. Yeah. 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 That he has a morbid uh, obsession with... With violence, and he's found and a religious, and, and, a religious and, 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 and say, cover, a guise for it, and, and, and which operates for the people who go to the movie thinking this is a great religious experience. How do you explain to your 10-year-old, and there are families coming in by the thousands, that watching a man chained up and flayed to death for two hours is a deeply religious experience. Yeah, I mean, I it, mean it's it, very it, disturbing. It, it, the the idea of taking kind of children uh, to see this, I think, uh, is 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 insane. Uh, but you know, one one more point about the movie is that um, I think that it is an interesting history lesson, and I don't mean the history of Jesus and his uh, life and death. I think it's an interesting history lesson uh, and reminder uh, in terms of Christian history, because there has, after all, been uh, a, a great cult of death running 
coming through uh, certain strains of Christianity, uh, evidently including the one that Mel Gibson is most interested in. And, uh, you know, one can go and visit ossuaries in, in, in Europe and see bones wrapped up like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or something. Uh, and I think that this movie, by pr- precisely by its relentless and merciless physicality, its apparent idea that what happens to the earthly body of Jesus is what counts, and what happened afterwards, uh, the resurrection gets one minute at the end of the film. There is a strain of this running through Christianity, and, I, and it's kind of a medieval strain. And I think it's kind of interesting to be re-reminded of that. What do we make of the marketing effort by uh, Mel Gibson in terms of the way uh, he has presented this to a whole range of groups who have bought, you know, blocks yeah. of tickets to to see the movie? and the appeal that he hopes it'll make. Is this simply a very keen marketing mind at oh. work, or is it something else? Well, I was alliance. driving through Tennessee. I was driving through Tennessee this morning, and the, all the radio stations were tuned to this subject, and they had an interview with Gibson, which like, apparently is being uh, relayed everywhere, where he says, this is the end of my career. I'll never work again. I've, I've been so Barbara, brave. Is this the Dinosaur interview I've, I've mar- or something I've, else? I've, 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 I've martyred myself. It's, it's a career-ending thing. Um, and they said, well, how can you say that? And he said, well, you know, what Hollywood's like. And uh, by the way, if people don't understand what he's implying there, um, they should. Uh, he, he, in fact, was able to build very cleverly a, a, a publicity strategy of upsetting and alarming the Jewish community and then inviting to uh, prepared screenings only groups of extreme conservative uh, Christian and some Jewish fundamentalists and preventing uh, people like myself. It took me ages to get hold of a pirate copy of the film. Uh, magazines have taken interest in the movie industry from, from seeing it at all. It's a very, very cynical strategy designed for profit and, and crowned by his self-pityingly saying it'll put him out of business, but he doesn't care because he's doing it all for Jesus. Evidently, he wants to feel pain. I think it's about time that he did. I certainly agree with that, but I must say that um, I think the claim that he might suffer in Hollywood is absolutely preposterous. And uh, just for one exhibit, I would point to Martin Scorsese. The Last Temptation of Christ outraged a lot more people, a lot more, I think, than this movie is doing for different reasons, for kind of opposite reasons. Uh, It didn't slow down Martin Scorsese. It certainly didn't slow down Willem Dafoe, who played Jesus in that movie. Of course, these are not major Hollywood players like Mel Gibson. They're people who operate sort of alongside the system, but they're still very much reliant on that system, and they've stayed there. But there's, I think on the marketing question, there's clearly an alliance of literalists, uh, whether it's the very traditionalist out of the mainstream Catholic or many, many evangelical Protestants. And I think what's happening to some extent is there are millions and millions of Americans who believe that this is the way the story happened. And what they found is Gibson, a global celebrity, an Oscar winner, a representative of a mainstream culture, that entertainment culture, that they think is essentially hostile to Christianity. How often do we talk about violence in other movies would be their response to a lot of this. They find in Gibson a kind of validation and promulgation of their faith. What do you make, John, about this father, his father, and, and Christopher touched on that, and his father and the Holocaust, and his father and, and Vatican II, and, yeah, it's uh, which deep, absolved yeah. the Jews of any... Well, it's deeply troubling. Uh, Gibson has not addressed in any forum that I've seen this very closely. Uh, My sense is that Vatican II continued an important tradition of of trying to get away from this. The Council of Trent took this up 400 years ago and tried to help a little bit. So I think that this is, it's just such explosive territory to wander into. I think all this is, what, what's just been said is fascinating. What's most important is what's on the screen. Crucifixion was a political weapon used by the Romans. It was a, sl- a way of slowly <coughs> torturing someone to death. It was intended to deter and to dis- by slowly destroying the body. Now, the, 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 what, what Gibson has done is in effect given the Romans their triumph by returning the spectacle totally to the destruction of a body and, and leaving the spiritual meaning out. There are brief flashbacks to the Sermon on the Mount and, and to the Last Supper. They, they have no resonance whatsoever. I don't agree that Jim Cavazil works well in those scenes. Um, it's in Does he Aram- act to play in Christ? Yes, I don't think it, I don't think he has any any power. It's distance. The word Jesus's words are distanced from us by having to read them in subtitles. So that Mel Gibson, the visual artist, becomes the hero of the occasion, not Jesus, the, the teacher and sage. 
In other words, you see what I'm saying? He's, he's, given the, he's given the Romans their triumph by turning it back into a spectacle of, of degradation and torture. John. What I just want to say, what I was saying is that Gibson has not run through his, every tenet of his faith, which Vatican II Council, which provision he rejects and which he accepts. And I think it's very interesting that the United States Catholic of, Conference of Catholic Bishops has issued pastoral guidelines about how believers should dramatize the passion. Don't put Jewish high priests in black. Don't portray them as a chanting mob. Don't portray Pilate as a passive, sensitive, not particularly strong ruler, almost every one of which Gibson violates. And that's church instruction. Is the cardinal sin of this film anti-Semitism or B, its emphasis on violence uh, does not capture the essence of Christianity and the message of Christ. There's no need to rank these, uh, these, yeah. these, these, these failings. I, I think that these are both the great failings of the film, uh, and, and they're both um, probably ultimately fatal to the film. But I think also the movie is interesting, as I said before, as a kind of a, of a, of a reminder of a very important strain of Christian history that, who knows, may be coming back. Uh, I also think that uh, Gibson has done something kind of interesting here. He's made an art film. He's made a movie that really is not going to have much of an audience. It's going to have a lot of people going this week and probably next week. But after that, I think it's going to end up on the video store shelves. And I think it's going to have two kinds of, so to speak, cult audiences over the years. It's going to have a certain kind of religious believer that's going to want to watch this stuff and maybe watch it over and over. And it's going to have the kind of kids uh, and eccentrics uh, who collect and savor uh, the faces of death uh, and uh, mondo movie, a uh, horror flick uh, uh, kind of imagery, because it really does have that kind of, uh, of, 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 of ugliness to it. But I, I think that Gibson has, in that sense, put himself on the line. He spent a lot of money on a movie that I think over the years is really going to have a very limited following. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, David. Uh, Christopher, thank you. It's good to have you here. Well, there. Thanks. John Meacham, you have to go catch a plane. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Charlie. We'll be right back. Stay with us.